Hello, I'm Jason Solomons. Welcome to another fabulous edition of Seen Any Good Films Lately. I've got a couple of wonderful guests on the show today sharing their latest news and some treasured movie memories. And they're kind of like this crazy fucking, you know, English white guy goes in there and he's so weird that he gets away with it. And then suddenly the room just exploded, like as a real explosion of, of a standing ovation that just wouldn't stop. It just went on and on and on until we left, which I did too early. I'm too modest, too Danish. That was a, a, a massive moment, I think. You heard the distinctive voice of our old chum, Nick Broomfield, who's dived back into the murky world of 90s gangster hip hop for that rare thing, a sequel doc. Last Man Standing, Sugar Knight and the Murders of Tupac and Biggie. And we're also joined by Oscar winner Thomas Vinterberg, founder of Dogma, now toasting success with the Danish midlife drinking drama Another Round. Thomas Vinterberg faces the famous sagful questions. We'll hear from Nick and Thomas after I tell you if I've seen any good films lately. On this podcast, I do like to concentrate on good films, hence the title. But I do have to sometimes share my thoughts on the ones that don't quite hit where I thought they might. Supernova, for example. This is a drama starring Stanley Tucci and Colin Firth as an ageing gay couple on a road trip to the Lake District in a rickety camper van or motorhome. We soon realise that the trip has something valedictory about it and that Stanley's character, an American novelist called Tucker, who's been living in Britain for years, is suffering from early onset dementia. It's a bit of a secret, but we, we get there. Colin plays a concert pianist called Sam, who's taken time off touring to make this trip and to care for Tusker, his longtime partner. I was very conflicted by these two famously married stars playing a gay couple. Now, of course, they've both done it before. Devil Wears Prada, for example, a single man. Colin was brilliant in that. But this is a low-budget film with a very naturalistic feel. And I just didn't buy it from the very first moment, not for an instant. I just kept thinking, well, why are Stanley Tucci and Colin Firth doing this? I mean, it should be a big awards movie. And obviously that was missed out there's no chemistry between them. And maybe that's it. There's just, you know, Firth and Tucci, like, you know, Meg Ryan and, and Billy Crystal have chemistry. Firth and Tucci don't. <laughs> Neither of them, however, looked comfortable. And I think it's because they were playing parts that they perhaps shouldn't have been cast in. Now, the film is also hampered by a really dull script from which you know, even these seasoned performers could not ring any grace notes. But it's, you know, old couple banter about sat-navs and map reading. And it just was really looked really dull as a film too. Nothing felt authentic about it. It was a very odd feeling to watch Supernova. It does build to this climactic scene of Colin playing the piano. And clearly not playing it. <laughs> or certainly not as well as the, the, his concert piano, his character supposed to play it. it. It was acting and filming that was so poor. It had me sniggering behind my mask. I take... Very little pleasure in telling you this, but I had even less pleasure in watching Supernova. Time for my first guest today, doc maker Nick Broomfield. He was on the show not very long ago talking about his doc, My Father and Me, about his dad Morris and his superb industrial photographs of 50s Britain. It's a film in which I made a brief appearance, you might remember. So if you want to catch up with that interview with me and Nick, it's on all the menus of the podcast and it's on my website, jasonsolomons.com. And you can hear Nick's answers to the sagful questions on there. This time I was just catching up with him because he's back again with an ex excellent, gripping, investigative documentary, Last Man Standing, which revisits his own film from 2002, about 20 years ago, Biggie and Tupac. And with the all-powerful Death Row record producer Suge Knight now behind bars for at least 28 years, and in the heightened climate of Black Lives Matter, Nick goes further back into Compton uh, with the help of a local fixer called Pam, and they investigate further what really happened to two of the hugest stars in the world during those phony rap wars of the 1990s. Which officers are you saying were implicated in the murder of Biggie Smalls? So it's five officers that were involved in it. Okay, all right. What up? You want to set it off? People started talking more freely since Shook's incarceration. 
like the shadow behind Biggie Smalls and Tupac Shakur's murders. They don't have to be on camera if they don't want to be on camera. All right. We just record their voice. All right. People were now opening up to things I couldn't get answered before. I would put money on LAPD's involvement. Many of the people have kept a secret for 24 years. I don't know if he did this, but he was there. So I began by asking Nick Broomfield why he went back in, especially during COVID and BLM. It was a bit of a digression, really, from the way I was working. You know, I did, I've been making much more sort of emotional films about, you know, my father and, and, and then about, you know, Marianne and Leonard. Marianne and Leonard, you and you said that great. And all that. And then, you know, I think what happened was I liked Russell a lot. He died of this sort of massive heart attack. In this 2015. is your, your police, your, your main the police, police witness, Russell Paul. officer, who I, I always thought was a really good guy. You know, I sort of I believed in him, and he wasn't at all interested in money. He never asked me for any money. I mean, all these other people ask for money. Russell really didn't care about money. He really cared about the truth, and which is pretty unusual. But then he was sort of vilified, and there's a whole series came out on Netflix called Murder Rap which frankly was a load of bollocks. Mm. I mean, it was from one end to the other. And somehow this piece of, you know, fabricated stuff was broadcast and people believed it. We also talked about the Netflix effect on the documentary world. I don't think it's been particularly great for documentaries. I mean, it's obviously it's nice to sell them stuff because they pay a lot of money. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't but, want to cut your career off here. No, <laughs> but, but I don't think a lot of their products been particularly good great really i think it's very it's very conservative it's very about you know they, they don't take risks with they're, they're not interested in kind of world in action yeah. reveal stuff you know they're they're interested in celebrity they're interested in Octopuses. fairly safe forward stuff did you like the and octopus would you fall in love with an octopus i hated it <laughs> i thought it was hated shit. it wasn't it shit <laughs> piece of shit this piece of disney crap <laughs> pretending he's there all by himself when he's got a crew of 14 flapping around <laughs> with their flippers you know and probably 10 other octopuses <laughs> lined up just as stand-ins i mean i and and this nervous breakdown that he alludes to at the beginning you, you never hear anything. I it's it's like he's doing this incredible. And what thing did it for teach his... him? What's this? What did this octopus teach him to count to eight? What's the most? What's the most yeah. it could teach him? He didn't even lose any weight. We had to watch his <laughs> him flabbing around. In a, I thought, oh my god, another fat South African. Forgive me, but um, I thought this is anyway. I, I hated it. Yeah, good. I had to ask Nick what he thought of the artistic legacy of Tupac and Biggie, and if there was enduring genius there. His ability to write those lyrics as a stream of consciousness was amazing. I think Biggie was too. I think they were amazing wordsmiths, very different from each other. Biggie's is much neater and smarter yeah. and much less political. I think they both are geniuses and that's why they still have the stature that they have. And they were both a stream scholarship boys. I mean, hardly is a big surprise. You know, they were like, Biggie could have gone and done whatever he wanted to do, really. Only he he sort of fell in love with that image, and as with Tupac, people really believed in both of them because, well, they because they were, I think they were the real thing. They had a very traditional classical training, both of them, from exactly the background you would expect. I talked to his teacher at the Baltimore School of the Arts, and he just said, you know, you knew from the moment you saw him there was something in his eyes yeah. and. His whole performance and his incredible charisma and intelligence. And he had his own way of interpreting things. And you could just tell, he said, you know, someone who's going to go really, very really far. I also wanted to know what Nick thought would happen with this new film. And how was his own rep in the ghetto now? They well, I, I, your think, work? I think it's more the kind of journalists, uh, hip hop journalists and stuff who had seen the film. And they're kind of like this crazy fucking you know, English white guy goes in there and he, he's he's so weird that he gets away with it. That's That was what they said yeah. to me, you know. And of course, I was just really being who I am. Last Man Standing is out on July the 2nd in cinemas, but there is a Q&A world premiere with Nick and Trevor Nelson on June the 30th. You can get tickets for it at dogwoof.com. 
And if you want to hear much more of that interview with me and Nick Broomfield, tune in and catch up with me on my weekly radio show on Totally Wired Radio, where I stretch out and play lots of music as well. Nick joined me on the episode of June the 23rd. So it was a much deeper interview, much longer, uh, and you, there's music in it. And you can find it on Mixcloud or on totallywiredradio.com or on my website. And you can get into a bit of hip hop with me and Nick Broomfield. interview on seen any good films lately is supported by strike the distilled drink with all the spirit none of the alcohol now available in cans for that perfect summer party watching the footy or at one of the many outdoor movie events that have popped up around the country if you go to strike.com that's s-t-r-y-k-k.com i've got a blog on there about all the watching options and experiences that there are and why we do it so you can also order your strike drinks in advance there and get 40 percent off by entering the voucher code jason40 let's hope we'll be counting england's strikes against germany at the euros next week with a strike or something okay despite the moderate approach to drinking of our sponsor let's talk to thomas vinterberg the danish director whose latest oscar and bafta winning film is another round about four midlife teachers at a copenhagen high school who start experimenting with being a little bit drunk all day every day at first their lessons get very interesting but then it all gets a bit too much and spirals out of control of course it does I caught up with Thomas Vinterberg, the man behind such works as 90s favourites Feston, uh, Dear Wendy, and later films such as Far From the Madding Crowd, which he made here, and The Hunt, which, like another round, also starred Mads Mikkelsen. And we raised a glass to the new film's global success. Thomas Vinterberg, thanks so much for joining me on Seen Any Good Films Lately. I loved another round. Congratulations on that. Oscars, BAFTAs. Uh, I don't suppose when you start a film like this, you think that it will travel even uh, around the world quite so much. No, we, we were surprised by that. It's very ironic. This is the most Danish film I've ever done. It's, <laughs> it's like an ode to my country and it's deep into the drinking rituals and stuff of my country. <laughs> and it's been exploding into the world. Yeah, it's it's... It's wild. Yeah. I mean, lots of films about alcohol have been made. And you can go back to like Days of Wine and Roses or Leaving Las Vegas. And they tend to be very tortured uh, relationships with alcohol. This was a, a little different take on it. This movie started as a celebration of alcohol, purely. We very quickly realized that if we wanted to tell a truthful tale and not just being provocative, we had a responsibility uh, to talk about all the families and lives that are being destroyed by this as well. But I guess over time, it developed into a movie about living as opposed to just existing, which is also why maybe it has been doing so well all over the world, and particularly in the world of confinement and bankruptcy and pandemia and stuff. Like yeah. My wife said to me when we were watching it again, she said, uh, did you have you thought about uh, adopting this this kind of way of living as, as a way of life will you let me know if you start doing it it does look it does look <laughs> like it's it's something that happened i don't know if, if anyone has has tried it as a result of your film what i hope is not is not that people go and get drunk who am i to tell people what to drink and when to drink and how to drink but it might inspire people a little bit yeah you know there might be an element of carpe diem in this <laughs> such as back in the days with that poet society. Our lives has become very confined, actually, not only because of the pandemic, but there's a constant evaluation of everything we do. Yeah. Even I... in our cell phone, it evaluates how many steps we take. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> and all interviews are being numbered up at a certain amount of clicks. And yeah. at school you're, and, and social media, 40 times a day you're being about. And it creates an enormous pressure a self-awareness pressure. I thought we were in an abstemious society, Thomas. I thought we were in the, the in the world where we're supposed to have non-alcoholic drinks. You know, my show is sponsored by uh, a non-alcoholic beverage, not gin, not vodka, not rum. 
uh, they taste like it, but they're not it. That's what I thought we were in that world. Well, there's many ways to get inspired. Uh, you can get inspired through alcohol or through thinking that you're drinking alcohol <laughs> or being amongst people who drink. There's actually this ex experiment. There's a bar. You have 40 young people. 20 of them get drinks. The other 20 get drinks with no alcohol. And they're all getting equally drunk, basically. So I guess life can make you drunk if, if, you, uh, if you're good enough, good enough living it. Yeah. Wasn't it Baudelaire who said, il faut toujours être ivre, one should always be drunk. And uh, he meant on poetry, on some, uh, but, you know, not necessarily drink, you know, which, that's how you should approach life in general. Right. And Bogart who said, it's as if the rest of the world is always a couple of drinks behind. <laughs> Bogart and Baudelaire that's what we like on this show Thomas right right <laughs> well, uh, have you seen any good films lately what have you been watching I've been watching a lot of movies I watched uh, the Oscar movies I really really enjoyed The Father as an example I, yeah I loved it too I, I thought it was amazing and uh, it brought me in tears also for personal reasons of course but, but I was amazed by that one. but I also so, you know, La Lorna from South America, is the p p films that didn't make the cut of the Oscars, which was amazing movies. Um, yeah, yeah, La, La Llorona, been... yeah, I saw that one too. Outstanding, I thought, yeah. Right. The Mexican film, what was it called? I'm No Longer Here. Yo No Estoy Aquí. I, we loved that too. That just, I thought, I thought I've never seen amazing. anything like that before. Hope from Norway, I thought was amazing. Uh, Sofia Coppola's film was fabulous. Now I'm back on Criterion Channel and I, and I just rewatched uh, The Leopard. Oh, it gets a pardo of Visconti. Beautiful, beautiful right. choice. It's actually, it has a reason because I, I had a conversation many years ago with Burton. Oh. And I, and I said, I'm sorry, I stole a scene from it where they dance around the house in festival, in, in the celebration. I took that from Fanny and Alexander. Yeah. Where they do the same thing, exactly the same. And he said, oh, it doesn't matter. I stole it from the leopard. He said, <laughs> and, and, and I never had the chance to really, I, I forgot that. So I, I checked it out and he's right. He stole it very specifically. Well, you steal from the best, I think, if you're going to steal. So that's that's a great idea. What's your first trip to the cinema? What was the film you saw on your first trip to the cinema? Uh, it was a Swedish film. I can't remember the name. It was like Far Out. Hesse and Tay, I think they were called. Uh, big hats, naked women, uh, a cake that suddenly was, you know, it was like a bit on acid. But um, <laughs> Tarkovsky's uh, Solaris was the first not the first, the second movie where I went to the cinema alone. How old were you? I don't know. Very young. Right. 12 maybe. 14 or something. And that stayed with me. Which cinema was this? It was a very sort of art housey, off-Broadway cinema in Copenhagen. And I, I don't know what attracted me. I don't know what made me go see this movie. And normally I wouldn't go alone. But this time I did. And it was... Um, an extraordinary experience. That I, yeah. Most I guests on the show say Bambi or Snow White. Uh, you, you say Tarkovsky Solaris, but then you are well, the Oscar winning film. That's insane. Well, Bambi I saw on every Christmas show. Yeah. <laughs> which I thought was, was nice. No, it's the cinema, isn't it, that, that impacts on you in that right. way. What, what films did you watch? Any films for research for, uh, for uh, another round? Fight Club. Mm. Husbands. The, the Cassavetes uh, film, Husbands. 
Right. Yeah. Husbands is what wives don't know, only suspect, and have never understood until John Cassavetes made a film which Time Magazine calls one of the best movies anyone will ever see. Fellini? Just Fellini, basically. Oh, Fellini. Mm. Well, all of his movies, I'm a core in half, has this thing that it happens in the streets. Yeah. It's a lot of people yelling to each other from distance and in streets. That's a very Southern European thing that I love, basically. That always, I'm super attracted to it. Yeah, nice to see it in, in Copenhagen as well, because we always think of the snow or something or something cold. But yeah, there's got a lot, yeah, of, lot you, of action you in the of street. Isolated, modest, modest lives mm. in the dark north. But we can run around in the street and misbehave as well. Yeah, it was good and, to see uh, it. <laughs> and uh, so it was very, actually very inspired by these, but this, this Italian, Southern European vibe. Did you have a film poster on your wall when you were a student or a teenager? Yeah, for some reason I had the postman always rings twice, the Jessica Lange. With Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Yeah, for some reason. It's a very sexy poster, that's what, that's the reason. And it became, you know, part of my teenage fantasies. Uh, more than the David Bowie poster I had. Yeah, I've been dreaming a lot about Jessica Lange for that reason. Yes, I the t- it's, a, it's, the, it's the sexy tights in that one. But it's not kind of, it wasn't a poster that I went out and bought. It was a poster that appeared in my life somehow. That's what I mean. But but her legs and that poster uh, stayed with me. Definitely. Yes, I'm, I'm now you, thanks for reminding me. I'm, I'm going to need a little lie down. <laughs> uh, what about now? Do you have posters in your, in your house or in your right, office? Right, well, actually... Actually, I've done something against my rules. I've, I've put up some of my own posters. Yes. And I was taught by my dear friend and collaborator and teacher and ins- inspirator, uh, Mons Rukov, who's no longer with us, who wrote Festin with me, oh. that, that, that awards and posters should be taken down after one year. Then it's time to move on. <laughs> So you're not stuck in your past. So I have to change them soon. Okay. Where's your BAFTA? And I have a can poster somewhere. Of course. Where's your BAFTA and your Oscar? Uh, my BAFTA hasn't arrived. <sighs> uh, or has it? I'll get on to them. I'll get on to them. Well, I'll call them. Higher filming BAFTA? No, I don't know why. No, it's on its way. So it's in the mail. <laughs> and, and the Oscar is somewhere with my, one of my friends because they're getting robbed here. People steal them. Well, how many Oscars are there to steal? Well, my producer uh, won, won an Oscar with uh, the Susan Beer movie. Uh, uh, yes, in a different it, world. Yeah, she had it for three weeks and then there was burglary and it was stolen and nothing else was taken. So, so people know. So, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm putting my Oscar somewhere for a while. Well, why is And then I'll decision. bring it back to my office, I guess. Wise decision. The great Oscar thieves of Copenhagen are at work again. Uh, if you could give, I give you time travel as a gift, which film set would you go to to visit? Eight and a half. Eight and a half. Fellini, yeah. Of course. Yeah, what a great... Uh, you'd have a great time. Yeah, I think you'll really it enjoy it. And you know, you know the food will be good. The f- everything will be good. The <laughs> food, the men, the women, everything. That... It, the decor of the vibe would be intense. Yeah. Uh, it would be so undanish. <laughs> I think you, you, you like dining tables. I think Fellini always made lunch was the, was the big highlight of the day uh, on a Fellini movie. For the whole yeah, movie. I guess people were drinking. Uh, drinking, at work. yeah, spaghetti, whatever. They, they still drink at work in Belgium. And I'm probably in France as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, little, little, well, you know, a little glass of wine can't hurt. Gives you the alcohol level that you require for the afternoon. Have you ever? That's funny because Denmark is associated with a place where we drink all the time, but we would never drink at work. No, that would be, yeah, no, that no. would just it. It wouldn't be legal. <laughs> the design would go to pieces. Every all that beautiful European design, like your glasses, every, everything would be wonky and out of shape. So that would exactly, be exactly. What about? Uh, have you ever fallen in love at the movies, Thomas? Well, as a child, I fell in love with Abba. <laughs> Like, really? What, in the documentary, the, in the Lasse Hallström the, documentary? Well, not, no, the blonde singer. Oh, my gosh, Agneta. I was truly in love with her. Yeah, me too. But, uh, uh, 
as in huge feelings. Mm, that was my first, my first love. Interesting, yeah. In the movies, I must have been falling in love many times. Well, that's what we do, right? We fall in love with film stars, mm. actresses, actors. I did fall in love with, with uh, The Leopard a week ago. Yeah. I, like, you can fall in love with a novel. You don't want to read too much because there has to be some for tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting because the, the slow pace of the film is just like, not much happens really. Mm. It's seductive, I guess. It's a very seductive looking film. You just want to be in that room yeah. with, with this person and these people. Listen, you just made a great musical moment in a movie. What's your favorite screen musical moment? Wow. Uh, front titles of um, Harrison Ford flying into the future. Ah, oh, I forget names. Uh, Blade Runner. Blade Runner and what? what what's what's, what's Van Gelis? Van Gelis. Van Gelis. And this entering this new world with Van Gelis is still it still gets to me. Mm. And then the opening titles of 1900, which is basically just a painting, zooming in on a painting. Or traveling towards a painting and a fantastic piece of music. I think those two would compete. Is that Morricone? I think it might be 1900. It, it, it will be, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. What's your favorite cinema in the world? Well, it's the basement of my friend's house. My friend has money mm -hmm. and he moved into a great house, which had a cinema in the basement, which because it had a, a rich producer living there in back in the 60s. And it's it's beautiful old velvet decor. Oh, lovely. In, in Denmark? It's in Denmark. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. Lovely. And what about the best screening that you've ever been to? Well, am I allowed to pick one of my own? Of course. I think the celebration in Cannes in 98 was massive, was the most massive experience I've had because it was such a surprise to us that we even got to Cannes. And I remember Julio Iglesias sitting in front of me with a very young girlfriend <laughs> doing like this because the movie was outrageous. And I thought, Jesus Christ, I'm going to get butchered. And then, and then suddenly the room just exploded, like as a real explosion of, of a standing ovation that just wouldn't stop. It just went on and on and on until we left, which I did too early. I'm too modest, too Danish. So I think I left after seven or eight minutes. <laughs> uh, had I been Tarantino, I would have milked this and stayed for 15 minutes. Yeah. But, uh, but that, that was a... That was a, a massive moment, I think. Yeah, that, well, I remember it. You arrived. It was like, who is this guy? Who are these filmmakers? What is this? I remember it was my, one of my, I think it was my first can. So I do remember that. Oh, you were there? Well, for, I was, at I, I was the, not at that one because that was the, the gala screening that for, I right. had seen the film in there. But, you know, the, the, the fuss over the day when it played, it was like, what is this great film? Yeah. And we're still talking about it still. And I still think there's a theatre production of it actually in London, opening in London again soon. Um, I'm there's, sure there's always one somewhere it seems fantastic well, what I've said before it's a bit like I have a very famous son who, <laughs> who travels the world and occasionally sends me a little bit of money you know it's uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting experience Thomas it's been brilliant talking to you thanks for coming on, on seeing any good films lately it's re really fantastic uh, talking to you I just wanted before we go um, what do you think the, the, the future for cinema is now? Now everyone's been, you know, watching films, streaming them. You're making a TV series. Well, what, what about the future of cinema around Europe? I'm not worried about cinema. I, I belong to the people who think that the world have not changed uh, because of the pandemic. I think uh, people will run back into the cinema 
and they will run back into the airplanes as well, unfortunately, and uh, everything will be the same. It takes more than, than this to change the world. It takes a, a world war or a world trauma of kind. Mm. This sensation of experiencing something at the same time as others, it's as with music, as at a concert, that's enormous. When a room is filled up with the same shock or same vibration, uh, and there's resonance with amongst the audience is something you cannot replace and something that people will be yearning for. And that's, you just can't get, get that in front of your screen at home, at your screen at home. Mm. So I'm not that nervous now. Well, another round will certainly be one of those films that inspires all of those exact emotions when people see it all together. Uh, Thomas Winterberg, congratulations. Lovely to see you and uh, best of luck with another round as it uh, goes on another round of uh, cinema openings. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank Cheers. you. Brilliant. Thomas Vinterberg's Another Round is in cinemas from July the 2nd. And you can get a special Q&A with some screenings featuring me and Thomas Vinterberg in further conversation about the making of an Oscar winner. And you can read more with me and Thomas Vinterberg about his career and what his films mean in my newspaper, The New European. Just time to tell you about Sparkling, the story of champagne, which is a very bubbly doc by Frank Mannion, who's long been one of UK and Irish films Bon Vivant. Uh, And here he is going around France, sipping champers with the owners of the finest houses, from Bollinger to Tatanger to Paul Roger, Verve Clicquot. He literally clinks glasses with all of them. Now, I've had my fair share of champagne, what with my glamorous showbiz life in film, but I've never actually paid enough attention to what I'm drinking and its history. Disputed, though that turns out to be. Don Perignon himself is acknowledged as the founding monk who sipped the fizzy wine and exclaimed, Come quick, I can taste the stars. There are many other eureka moments popping up in here, including the rise of English sparkling wine from Windsor, Sussex and Kent. Can we really give the French a run for their money? I enjoyed this film and I felt a little bit giddy after, but that might have been the uh, the free champagne on offer. So on that note, on a rather boozy edition, we go out on Jason's Three to See. Last Man Standing, Nick Brimfield's documentary, is really back on top, top form investigating. He's been doing personal films for, for a while and this one is really sort of Nick nailing down what happened and looking at the LAPD in forensic detail. Last Man Standing, great doc. In the Heights, the musical by Lin-Manuel Miranda. Enjoy that summer in a screening, basically. And if you've got the stomach and the head, In the Earth by last week's guest, Ben Wheatley. Shout out too to Mae Martin and Feel Good on Netflix. A very smart, tender and often funny comedy about love. That's it. Thanks to Nick Broomfield, to Thomas Vinterberg, to Strike and to Kate Dawkins, my ever trusty editor. See you next week on Seen Any Good Films Lately when we go truffle hunting for one of the loveliest and certainly tastiest documentaries of the year. See you then.